Okay, welcome back. Uh, we are here again uh, as part of our video training series on the new EFI Colorproof XF RIP for Epson. Uh, I'm Mark, and uh, welcome back, Larry. Thanks, Mark. Good to be here. Uh, as some of you know, this, this video you're about to watch is an important one. Uh, it is the video where we are going to launch the EFI RIP for the first time. Uh, we are going to create um, a workflow and an output device um, that will be compliant with the Grackle 2006 coded 1v2 specification from the Ideal Alliance. In fact, uh, as of today, we just received a certification uh, uh, from the Ideal Alliance for the workflow that you're about to see us build. So this is a good example of how the uh, EFI RIP and our output device, our mm -hmm. printer, and our ink and media can be certified for Grackle 2006 uh, 1v2. Uh, yeah, that's with our standard proofing paper um, 240. And in the proofing edition SKU, there's actually a full roll of 24-inch standard proofing paper in the box. So yeah, that's you're ready point. to go. So right out of the box, they have the media they need to be certified yeah. for Grackle. They that's do. pretty cool. Yep. All right, so um, we're going to run the RIP for the first time. Uh, the first thing is to note is down here at the dock, if you have already have not yet seen the RIP install video, you need to do that. Uh, this video was, is shot right after we finished doing the installation. Uh, so watch that video first. But we've already installed the product, and it is now running live. Uh, we can go ahead and run the client software for the first time. And um, just a couple notes here. This RIP was run, run once before on this computer. Um, but Larry, I understand that for the first time uh, on a brand new PC when this is run, uh, they will get an admin login screen, right? Right. You're going to get a dialog box looking for lo uh, login. And the defaults to start, um, the user would be admin, all lowercase. The password would be admin, all lowercase. And the basically server address, if you're running the client on the same PC as the server as we are here, then you can just type in all one word, all lowercase, local host. And that'll get you to the stage we are at right now. Okay, very cool. So, you know, EFI uh, has developed a new setup wizard to help make the installation of a workflow and an output device, our new Stylus Pro 9900 in this case, easier to do. Uh, and it works great, by the way. Um, but I am going to show you uh, a different way of doing it that maybe it's a little harder, uh, but it gives you more detail along the way. And, you know, Larry, um, Larry is actually the guy here at Epson America that is uh, responsible for training and certifying all of our dealers on how to use this product. And so he'll be going over that in his own classes in, in much more detail than we are here in this video. But uh, I'm actually going to um, hit yeah. continue and just select uh, a default workflow and just say finished. Because I'm going to do it the hard way, Larry. Okay. Right? I'm not going to okay. go through the wizard. Well, you could actually have done it harder. You could have canceled the window and then had to make the default oh. workflow from start. Okay, so, so you know what? So you did take one, you did take one step from there. All right, so I'll delete it, oh, okay. and I'll start from scratch here. Hold right. on a second. All right, so making it the worst case scenario, <laughs> this is how I would do it. Now, uh, this RIP is really made, uh, and it's an excellent EFI, and the changes they've made um, is just awesome. And, you know, I got it. Got to tell you, the guys in the talent and the engineers over at EFI have made one of the coolest products we've ever seen for WIP workflows. I mean, the idea of handling users' workflows and output devices gives me a lot of flexibility to try to set up this RIP uh, to handle virtually any workflow I want. And, and as of right now, of course, we're going to create a workflow that is certified by the Ideal Alliance for the Grackle standard going to a new Stylus Pro uh, 9900. Um, as, as a trainer on this, I would uh, the only caution I have in this process is when you start with no workflow, you're highlighted and you're working on the EFI linearization workflow right now. And that's actually one you don't want to touch. You never want to modify any of the settings for the linearization workflow. So just be aware of that. And I can never figure out why EFI even has that here. Uh, well, you don't even want to touch it. Yep. Don't it's, even it's, deal with it. It's basically set up for no, no color management. And that's where when you create linearizations and ICC profiles, which we'll do in another video, um, you need that no color managed workflow. Gotcha. So that's what it's there for. So this is pretty easy. We're going to create a new workflow and then we're going to modify the settings for that workflow so that it's compliant with the Grackle uh, standards from the Ideal Alliance. I can create a new workflow by right clicking in this area and just select new workflow. Of course, I can also come up here uh, and define a new workflow by clicking on this button. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and select the default setting. There's a lot of pre-done templates in here, but I'm going to go ahead and just select the default one and start from scratch. So here we have a workflow. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is come over here. Uh, 
You notice that when I click on an output device, the area here changes. This is where we're going to be making all of our detailed settings for output devices. If I click on workflows, you can see all the uh, information here changes. I'm not yet going to turn and link any of this stuff on yet because I'm going to be um, adding this stuff as we go. So obviously the first uh, row up here is your, is your top menu and then there's submenus. First tab is server. It just gives you some information about what this computer is doing, what's going on with the, the RIP right now. Uh, and how much memory and disk space is left. Um, the next tab is workflow. We have one sub tab called general. This is the basic information about the name for this workflow, which is the same here. So we're going to go ahead and name this something that makes sense to us. Uh, maybe something like uh, Grackle Coded 1v2 uh, Certification. Uh, the description can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, workflow for uh, Crackle 2006 coded 1v2 uh, certification. I could also add information in here about the, the paper type. Epson, in this case, we're going to be using Epson standard uh, proofing paper 240. Um, but you can add the description of what this is so if anyone else comes by and wants to know what is this workflow all about, they can do it. By the way, as I type things in, you'll notice this icon lights up here. Uh, whenever this icon is lit, it means that a save is required. So if I hit save right now, you'll see that it saves me uh, to date where I'm at or the steps I've already done. You can see it's already renamed it. Um, the next settings here is for previews. Uh, these are jobs that come in and how you preview them within the job explorer. Uh, which we'll talk in more detail in another video. I just leave it as the default. Source files is how you want to delete files after they're done uh, processing. Uh, you can set these any way you want. Um, and you can also tell it to delete the uh, preview files that get created as well uh, any way you want. Um, we always end up saying do not rip and print on the fly. Uh, this is an important checkbox, Larry. You know, one of the things we found was that if you wanted to have, let's say, multiple printers connected to the same CPU and same computer, Having this turned off works a lot better. Right. Uh, as you mentioned earlier in an earlier video, this is actually running a multi-core CPSI <laughs> or multi-CPSI uh, PostScript 3 RIP, which means we have four indiv individual CPSI uh, cores running, right. which means I could be processing four jobs all at the same time, which is right. pretty cool. Um, anything beyond that, uh, it starts to really take a lot of processing power. So I have found yeah. that rip and print on the fly off is the best way to go there. Yeah, we, all, we also have a, a high resolution 1440 by 1440 mode of rip resolution. And to process a file, complex files, let's say you know it's four color plus spot colors, um, large page size, when you're processing a file at that resolution, um, if you wanted to run rip and print on the fly, you'd have to have a super beefy computer. I mean, you'd have to have the latest, you know, processors, memory, fast drives, and all that to even attempt to do that. So I think your recommendation to just leave that unchecked is probably the best. Good. Um, we don't want the printer pausing, and if the, if the rip and print on the fly can't keep up with the printer, you're going to see a pause in the print. That's your indication. Absolutely. And you know, the, the 900 class printers, whether you're using a 7900 or 9900, that new thin film piezo print head, it, it's so fast. Yep. Even in the 1440 by 1440 output mode, it, unless you've got a really high-end computer, it's hard to keep that machine at yep. full speed. So we recommend to turn that off. I always turn bi-directional on now. Um, the new printhead technology on the 900 series is so good, uh, and the screening technology that EFI's implemented from Epson in this product is so good, I don't see yep. any difference in image quality whatsoever between a bi-directional print or printing in unidirectional. It looks identical. So you might as well leave bi on, and it's twice the yeah. speed. Yeah, my only comment there, we're setting up a certified workflow. You want to you set it and leave it. In other words, we're, we're looking for the optimal color. And so you don't want to be flipping back and forth between UniD and BiD. Set up the workflow and remain on that consistent standard, and you're going to get the best results. So for workflow general, that's kind of what this does. And again, it's really logical. You just kind of go through these settings and pick the choices that you think are best for your particular workflow. Again, we're building this workflow uh, against the Grackle-coded 1v2 spec. Um, under input, 
Uh, we have general. This is where I define where I want my hot folders to be located. We'll have a video dedicated to this on another, on another video. We also have information about remote jobs and how JDF is being taken care of. Under file formats, this is how file formats that are brought into the RIP are handled. And of course, you know, the guys at EFI um, support pretty much every file format you can possibly think of. And the really yep. cool thing about the Epson version of this RIP is that we've given you a uh, one bit uh, file for it standard. It's yep. not an option. This is a very expensive option that gives, I think, a truer representation of the press. Uh, but we give it to you standard. So just a quick run through on this, how we handle PostScript and PDF files. Um, no recommended changes anywhere in here. Leave everything at the default. We really went through this RIP and made sure the defaults were correct for pretty much 99% of the workflows you're going to get. Uh, nothing to do with EPS and job detection. Again, our settings here are the best for everything that's out there. One thing to note, um, we have two PostScript engines in this RIP. We have Adobe PostScript 3 which I said earlier has four versions of CPSI running in parallel, so you yep. can process four jobs at the same time. That's a new technology <laughs> from Adobe that EFI has uh, taken advantage of, which is awesome. By the way, that's also the latest version of CPSI from Adobe. Yep. And we also have Adobe PDF Print Engine 2.0. There should be a little 2.0 there, but this is the 2.0 version of PDF Print Engine. And I can turn on whichever PostScript core I want to use or language I want to use to process my data. Um, my recommendation is unless you're doing a lot of variable data printing or a lot of complex packaging work where you have a lot of spot colors that are, that are defined as transparencies that are overlaying on top of each other, and if you find problems in rendering that information properly with the main Adobe PostScript 3 engine, then go ahead and try ripping that job through Adobe PDF Engine 2.0. That's kind of how I would handle that. What do you think? Yeah, Larry? Adobe PDF. I mean, they're both they're both state of the art print engines. Um, Adobe PDF is going to be a little bit slower. It, it takes a little bit more time and processing as it interprets and tries to figure out those transparencies and layers and some of the other things. Um, plus, you lose the multi-core technology, so you can only process one file at one time. What I do think is great is if you're having a problem with a particular file, you can try running it against a different workflow, and a lot of times that'll that'll get your file out to proof. Um, where you yeah, may otherwise actually, be struggling. Yeah, you know, one of our beta sites had that. They had a PDF file that just would yep. not not rip properly through CPSI or through other rips that don't use Adobe. Uh, we took that <laughs> file and ran it through Adobe PDF uh, Print Engine 2.0, and, and it ripped beautifully and printed beautifully, got the yep. job out the door. So good point. That's an awesome uh, way of doing it. Again, it's just really cool to know that, you know, EFI has the resources and the talent back in Germany to actually be able to implement in a single workflow rip both types of, of RIP technology, right. which is pretty awesome. Right. And again, being partners with Adobe, you know, we're getting yep. the latest technologies here. Yep. I, can, um, I can cover that next section, because it looks like the way it's laid out, it's actually um, combining or is in addition to the PDF print engine. But that image EPS and image PDF print engine, that selection is specific to very um, defined files that are basically save as single files out of uh, uh, Adobe Photoshop to either an EPS or a PDF format. So for your normal workflow, your normal files that you're running, those aren't going to come into play at all. And it's not that I've got to select some combination of them. It's specific to those file types. So, you know, image EPS and PDF in the old, is an older format is what you're saying. And, it, and, yes. and it's a format that used to take rips forever to rip. Right. Uh, one of the benefits, by the way, of PDF Print Engine 2.0 is that a, um, EFI has found a way to dramatically speed up the processing of these file formats. But uh, the reality yeah. is just leave it native and be well, done. Well, and, and plus, if you, if you are working in Photoshop or have something to, to work with on that file format, you can take the fully layered PSD files, all the layers, all the curves, all the text layers, and just drop it right on the rip, and it's going to render that. You don't even need to save out yeah. as PDF or EPS. That's true. Yeah, yeah that's right. one of the things that's cool about being a true Adobe uh, product uh, from EFI is that we support PSD files as yeah. one of the formats. It's pretty hot with all the layers. Yeah. All right, so uh, one bit is a very powerful feature. Uh, it's one of the, uh, I think it's going to be one of the hottest versions of reasons why people are going to be wanting to buy this new RIP from Epson uh, and EFI. Uh, to be able to handle the separated files, the exact same files that you ripped on the uh, plate setter, sending those exact same files into a hot folder to be uh, combined and to, to create a finished contract proof that shows the proper dot, the screen angle, the frequency and everything is just awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a very expensive technology, comes standard with our product. Uh, the only two uh, things we're recommending here to change, leave everything else default, is click these two boxes, uh, analyze the file name from left to right, extract color separates from the file header, 
Check these two. Make sure contract with sharp dots is clicked on, is checked. Uh, and that's all you have to think about for the one bit. Again, we'll have a separate video on this in more detail and printing one bit files. But uh, if you make these settings, when we go to that video, we'll remind right. you again, but things will be a lot quicker and in, easier. In most cases, it'll pick it up. In some cases, you're going to need to basically build that job string name up top that looks a little bit confusing, but that's easy to explain. Uh, Tiffit uh, is, a, is a popular format as well. We have full support of that. And then the SciTech CT guys, uh, we're still making sure we support their file formats as well. So that's everything under input and file formats. Under layout, um, under job layout, this is how jobs will fall on the paper. Uh, all the defaults that we have already set with EFI is perfect. You do not need to change anything. Uh, the only uh, thing that you might want to play with is how it lines onto the sheet. Do you want it to fall uh, centered to the top? centered in the middle of the sheet that's defined if it's cut sheet. Um, I typically uh, just kind of go like that, Larry. I don't know if you have any comments or recommendations. That, that's, the leave fast, it alone. that's the fastest print mode. That's basically putting you know, the image data closest to the home position of the printer, and the print head has to travel less if it doesn't fill that sheet. So and it doesn't waste any media in that mode that as no, well. No, just be a little bit faster, so yeah. Uh, nesting, I'm making no changes to nesting because this is a uh, RIP uh, workflow that in my case I've decided not to do anything with nesting, but it's a very simple thing that you can do. We might have a video on that on another day. Uh, step and repeat is also fully support supported here, and again, I'm not going to turn that feature on for this particular workflow because it's not required. Uh, footer I am going to turn on. The footer is the uh, job ticket information that's printed on the bottom of the proof. Um, and it's a very cool technology that EFI has developed where we can create um, job tickets and customize them and actually create presets. Right now I have no presets, but I can go ahead and click on job ticket. I can add an image. I can upload a, a TIFF image. Uh, and they have some limitations here on the sizes, five by five centimeters. Uh, by the way, if you're going to upload your own company logo to make it look really good, rasterize the logo. Most people have logos that are EPSs, so open them up in Photoshop, rasterize them at about 2400 DPI uh, before you upload them, because this is not, does not accept an EPS file. Right. It only accepts a raster file. So if you want your, your logo to look nice and sharp and pretty like a true PostScript EPS would, just rasterize your EPS in Photoshop at a high resolution like 2400 DPI. It's going to be a small size file anyway, because the size is small, and then upload it, it'll look great. Um, the job ticket line one, you have actually six lines of information can be printed on the bottom of every proof. I like to put the job name on, the file format, uh, the file name and date of print I like. Um, I also like to uh, make sure that all three of these are checked. I like to know what profile was used, what rendering intent, and what LIN file was used. Uh, for job ticket three, I love to have uh, to know whether or not this particular job was printed with a three-dimensional color correction file. This is EFI's extremely powerful math behind uh, color, iterative color management, and uh, we'll have a video dedicated yeah. to this feature. It's just an awesome part of the product. Yeah, the and, if, and if you, if we're setting up a verified certified workflow here, and in order to do that, um, you, we want to create a, a 3CC file to go along with that. So and we'll show you how to do that. Knowing which one is attached is important. Uh, line four, I like to put the uh, workflow name. I also like to know what uh, resolution the RIP ripped the job and what resolution the final output was printed at on our printer. All that data shows up there. Uh, I actually leave uh, all this stuff the way it is, um, just to see what it looks like when it comes out. Uh, and I usually uh, don't actually have anything connected here. I, don't know if you I, have any... I like to check spot color names. That's going to give me a list of any spot color that you know was cool. in the job and print that out. And you can do user-defined text. So um, just as part of training or anything else, um, I always make you know all my training candidates type in their name so when they submit a print, I know who printed it. Very cool. Okay. Now what's nice is after I made all those settings, I can go ahead and hit save uh, and type in um, a name. Uh, and what's great is, is I can create multiple presets uh, and then when I come down here, I can just select it and it's done, which right. is really slick. I, I do want to point out the preset doesn't save any changes to the ticket width or font size or any of those things. So yeah. that's always a static whatever you set, um, just as a FYI. Very cool. Now under color is how this workflow, we still have workflow selected here as you know, so we're working on everything that has to do with the uh, workflow here. Um, and again, as I said earlier in the video, whenever this icon is blue, that means I still have some stuff that needs to be saved to this workflow. That was probably all the settings we made a minute ago. Uh, clicking on that makes it go gray, which means that so far all the changes I've made have been saved into this workflow here. Uh, obviously for color management, one of the key parts of the RIP, color management needs to be on. 
I am not going to Im use embedded profiles uh, if available. I'm going to leave that off, which means this RIP will override any embedded profiles that may come in from the files that this RIP will take uh, for this particular workflow. Since this is going to be a Grackle coded 2006 1v2 certified workflow, I need to select that profile here. Uh, this is where I would select my press profile, my output profile, what yep. I'm trying to simulate. What's great is everything you're seeing here today is what we give you for free. All of these output profiles have been already done and fingerprinted and are put into the RIP as default. Of course, you can add your own press profiles or other CMYK profiles you want us to match to. Uh, but you may notice that we have the Grackle coded uh, 2006 1v2 uh, specification output profile already here. Just a note, uh, we also have put in here uh, the swap coded number three and swap coded number five publication uh, profiles as well. Those are probably three of the most important ones right now that a lot of people are working on. So this will be a Grackle workflow, so we're going to select that. Uh, the rendering intent uh, should almost always be absolute color metric with paper white. Uh, there's a technology in this RIP which we'll talk about during the optimization video, the three-dimensional color correction video, which will create an awesome optimization of dial-in and color for this workflow, uh, where we'll talk about this a little bit more. But uh, just to give you uh, a very good recommendation here, always use rel uh, absolute color metric with a paper white. And I'll explain why more in detail when yep. we do the optimization. Do not select uh, relative uh, color metric uh, here. Uh, people will use relative color metrics sometimes to not have a paper tint, right. uh, which is what no paper white means. So absolute color metric means we're going to put a paper tint down. However, this RIP's got some really cool technology up its sleeve, which we're going to share with you in an optimization video. So you're going to want to use the more powerful or more accurate math behind absolute color metric. And we'll still be able to, if you want, not put a paper tint down. And I'll share that with you in another video. This is for information if data comes into the workflow uh, that is RGB based versus CMYK based. Uh, I just kind of use sRGB or Adobe yeah. RGB. Yeah, I'd, anything that's done for prepress and RGB typically st starts out as an Adobe RGB, so that's a good bet. And I like relative color metric with black yeah. point. Uh, that's a technology that Adobe introduced a while yep. ago with Photoshop, and it, it looks better than not doing that, so yep. I just select it. Again, if you have anybody doing work with RGB data, there's a problem, so it's probably not necessarily uh, the right file. You probably have to uh, do something with that. But right. uh, if you, it does go through, here are the settings that the Ripple use. The same with grayscale information. If grayscale uh, data comes into the workflow, here's how the color management system will handle it. I'll leave that as a default. And multicolor. If there's multicolor source information defined in a file coming in, again, you can so, select these settings here for how the Ripple handle it. Right, so if, you're, if you do a press profile and you're running hexachrome or you're running more than process color, not counting spot, and you build a profile for that, um, you know, six or seven colors, then instead of placing it up uh, where Grackle was placed, um, you would place that in this multicolor source. That's what that's used for. Very cool. And again, absolute color metric uh, would be used. Again, we won't talk into detail on this, uh, but the simulation profile, um, this is basically if you wanted the Stylus Pro um, 7900 or 9900 printer, which we haven't added yet. Yep. If you want it to match the quality of what we're defining here, but as a different yep. device, this is where you would select it. Um, however, we want to take full advantage of what the 7900 and 9900 can do uh, to match this standard that we're creating. So we're going to have it yep. not simulate anything. Actually, I, w I would set that to the Grackle standard that you selected above. And the simulation profiles actually is used also if um, something comes through with no profile. In other words, the, the RIP can't determine what it is. It's going to use that simulation profile. So by setting that the same you're as safe. what you set up top, you're safe. Good cool. way to go, my opinion. All right, well, so, we'll do it. Your right. opinion counts. All right, uh, Convert to Grayscale is a feature that EFI has been talking about with the launch of this new 4.0 platform. We're not going to deal with that. Uh, and then lab optimization, color optimization, visual correction, plate compensation is extremely powerful in this RIP. Uh, we're not going to go over these in detail here, but this is where we will talk about in another video how you can optimize this workflow and take full advantage of some of the newer technologies like iterative color management and things like that. Right. Um, but this is going to be a pretty powerful feature of the RIP, which yeah. we'll show you that, later. That la in order to meet the Grackle certification, that lab optimization, um, building that file and placing it in that area is critical. You're going to have to have it. Now, the spot color settings, we've made a default with the RIP to handle everything you could ever want. So the recommendation here under spot color is to don't touch it. 
Uh, if files come in with spot colors properly defined, this RIP will know how to search priority for those files and use them properly. Uh, if you would like to uh, have it do some other things, like if an unknown spot color comes in, have it auto print as a warning color, you can turn that feature on here. Uh, but we'll show you in another yeah. video when we print files how you can look at and override some of those right. uh, problems. Yeah, I actually prefer the unchecked is the best method on that. That way when the job comes in, you'll actually have the ability to control that spot color live and get it to process correctly. Very cool. All right, so under finishing, uh, we're not going to do any crop marks or anything like that. So that's the only thing there. We're going to leave that alone. Under output, this is some information that's very important. Um, this is how this workflow will handle the output uh, to our printer. How many copies, if you want to sort them, we're going to leave that alone. How you want the separations to be handled. So I want to merge all separations regardless of the file, whether it's a one bit uh, or it's uh, a composite file like PDF or yep. EPS or TIFF. We're going to merge it into a finished print. You can obviously um, do color separations or separate those separations as individual gray, gray components. But uh, we're going to go ahead and say merge uh, separations and not do an invert. And we're not going to be doing any cropping yeah. or anything to fit the media. That's uh, something you probably don't want to do if you want to do a contract proof. Under advanced, um, you have some settings here about missing dots. <laughs> defining the first printable dot and noise smoothing. Uh, we have found with the 900 class printers, the only setting you want to ever deal with here is do this. Simply come in here and type in 5% for noise smoothing. Uh, it's the best setting. Uh, we've tested this about a million times and we know that is the ultimate setting. So make sure you type in 5 for noise smoothing. That will make sure the RIP will really make sure and ensure tra transitions and gradients and blends are perfectly smooth with the 900 class printers. Yep. Yeah, and if you're working with a custom press pro profile, um, you'll also have information about showing missing dot and defined first printing dot on where you want to set that. So. Under remote, uh, we will talk about remote container and other things like that on another video, but this is how you would set that up for remote proofing. There's a lot of new technologies coming out, uh, not just from EFI, but from other companies where uh, this information and a lot of the data that comes out of this workflow can be uploaded automatically uh, or containers can be created automatically for remote proofing, yep. web control technology. I mean, it's very, very cool. Again, this RIP is a very high-end product and a really future-proof product yep. for a lot of your printers out there. Yeah, I just caution people, if, if you hit it or it's turned on to automatic, automatic, it is going to be generating automatically a remote output file that's going to start filling up your hard drive. So <laughs> if your hard, spa hard drive space starts decrementing rapidly, um, you might want to check that setting. Which is off by default, right. which is what we're doing here. Okay, and the last tab uh, is one of the coolest features of the RIP, um, especially if you've purchased the optional Epson Spectral Proofer. That's our inline spectrophotometer. Um, the, the new EFI RIP, the new Colorproof XF RIP for Epson has the ability to lay down two control strips and then auto read those strips and verify them for to different standards. We're actually going to do that in order for this, uh, uh, this workflow to be certified. I want to make sure that every print that comes out of this workflow gets verified it to its accuracy of this mm -hmm. specification. So how we're going to do that is first we're going to tell it to use a control strip. And we have two control strips that we can play with. We're only going to turn on one for this time. Uh, this control strip, uh, these are the wedges and the color bars that you can throw down on the bottom of the print that automatically gets printed after your job is printed. And then, of course, our spectrophotometer would read those colors. We uh, put in, by default, all the latest Ideal Alliance ISO control strips. And this is a very good one right here. The 12647-7 yeah. uh, is the newest one, uh, and that's standard in the RIP. Right. So I'm going to select that. So you not notice Mark selected the one with spectroprofer on it, because basically, each device has its own um, size of patch and those type of things. So there's multiple versions of the same target, and you want to make sure uh, with SpectroProofer that you select that target that has SpectroProofer at the end. And obviously, we want to print that target with color management so we can verify it with yep. the color management that's defined in yep. this workflow. Uh, it's going to be printed on every page, not every sheet. If I guess if you wanted to nest a lot of jobs on a sheet and have one a strip printed on just the sheet, that's how that probably would work. Otherwise, right, yeah, it's on every page. Absolutely. So we're going to have it on every page. Now, we're not just going to print out the strip because we have purchased the Epson spectrophotometer, which we call Epson SpectroProofer. We can have it auto-verify this strip in line after the print is done. So that feature now gets turned on. Uh, we're going to tell it to use the characterization data of the reference profile that was defined in this workflow. In this case, it is the profile which is defined by Grackle. It was the Grackle coded 2006 1v2 ICC. Uh, that's the data that's going to be used to uh, reference whether or not this verification pass or fails. Um, you can define and quickly select um, a custom. Uh, this is basically just a preset for all this data down here. I'm going to do a custom one. 
I'm going to choose the delta E format that is actually going to be used to calculate pass or fail uh, for this particular verification. And you know, the Ideal Alliance recommends a delta E 2000 as the math that's used, so we're going to use that format. And then here's the tolerance levels uh, for this particular verification. And I can come in here and type all this in. So uh, the only change I would make uh, from the default one is the average delta E of our patches, three is kind of too easy. Maybe if I had a lesser printer than Epson's, I would t leave it three. But since we have a um, Stylus Pro 9900 with HDR ink, uh, we can hit a lot better tolerances than three. So we're going to set that to a 1.5 tolerance, which means when this uh, target is printed on the bottom of the proof, and when our spectra proofer automatically verifies that target against this profile with this delta E process, these colors better hit at these specs. Otherwise, it will create a failure uh, on the job ticket or actually on the proof label, which we can automatically print. Now, this is why I wanted to show this to you as well. Notice it's grayed out. It's grayed out because I have not yet installed a printer. Once right. a printer is installed, I'll come back here and turn that feature on so that after it verifies it, it won't just tell me it verified in the RIP interface. It'll actually will print out the verification label uh, right there on the proof as well, which is the yep. coolest thing ever. Uh, so we're not going to do anything in Control Strip 2, only Control Strip 1, and we're going to save that out and we're finished. Now, this workflow is completed. I can go ahead and now uh, link it in. Of course, it has nowhere to go once a job hits it. So now we're going to add an output device. Now, this will go a lot quicker uh, adding yep. a printer than what we just did. Uh, again, I can add an output device by simply right-clicking and selecting output device. Or I can come up here and just click on new output device. And you can see it clicks, goes on. Here it is right here. And again, you can see this area <laughs> changes. Uh, server is the same as what you saw before, just information about the server. Here's the device setup. I'm going to type in the name of what this output device is, and uh, this happens to be an Epson Stylus Pro. Uh, make sure it looks nice. Uh, 9900. Uh, it's located in our uh, professional imaging lab. Uh, I'm going to pull this list down and select the 9900 uh, driver itself. Uh, it's very easy to connect it. Uh, I have to connect it here by TCP IP. A uh, good trick for you guys is um, you should have already saw another video uh, that we described how to install all the normal Epson drivers and utilities. But if you haven't, uh, you can go ahead and just simply install that uh, at this point. And it installs a utility called Epson Net Config. So if you don't know the TCP IP address of this output device, of this printer located in this area, I can just run my Epson Net Config utility. Uh, it'll go out on the network and find the printer. It'll find the IP address for me so I can write that down. So. Uh, this utility got installed as part of our driver install package right. that comes standard in every printer. Yeah. So anyways, um, the IP address is, is known. I'm going to quit out of this application. I'm going to type it in here. And I always hit test just to verify that this RIP saw it, and it did. <laughs> and I am done. Leave everything else there. Under media, uh, we're going to set the media up for, again, to match uh, the Grackle standard to be uh, in the certification of the Grackle standard by the Ideal Alliance. So obviously, Ultrachrome HDR is the only ink that printer supports. The media uh, is already pre-profiled and uh, pre-put into the RIP. Uh, this is a uh, paper that we've decided to use to be uh, certified uh, by the Ideal Alliance for the Grackle coded 1v2 spec. So I'm going to select Also Epson. in the box. And it's also in the box. This is the role we put in the box yep. with every printer, right? Yep. Very cool. Uh, then we select the resolution uh, that we want this job, to, uh, this printer to print at on that paper. Uh, we re pre-did three of the uh, most used resolutions. Uh, the 720 DPI uh, obviously is a very, very fast mode. It's also an extremely high quality mode. This is 1440 by 1440 mode, uh, which, is, which is the mode that I'm going to be using for the certification. And the 2080 DPI mode, I would only use that if you were doing one bit TIFF uh, type proofs um, yeah. and dot proofs. That higher resolution really does make a yeah. difference. So uh, yeah. I'll be using the 1440 in and out, and it tells you the information about it. Now, one thing to note, Larry, here, give us a little update on this. Notice that the resolution inputs 1440 by 1440. That's new. Right, right. That's a very high resolution input mode. In the past, um, it was either 360 or 720. So it, it renders um, line work and text and fonts amazing, um, but it's a, it takes a lot of horsepower to rip to that resolution. 
So again, you know, we talked about it earlier, if you're going to run it 1440 in, which is what that resolution is for the RIP resolution, you know, make sure you've got a, a Core 2 Duo, you know, three, 3 gigahertz or higher, or an i7. The this, this software runs fine on i7 processors, a Xenon, quad core, cool. um, something that's going to be able to help you process that file quickly. Um, the media information here, uh, the media is obviously on a roll versus a cut sheet. Uh, and this particular media that we've installed just now that came in the box with the printer is 24 inches wide, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. All right. If just make a note there, if you got if you have a 7900, not a 9900, you would select 24 inch roll spectra proofer um, for that media. It's not going to show up here. We tried to simplify the menus and only show um, uh, settings that are relevant to the device. Just wanted to make a note of that. Very cool. All right, so 24 inch, uh, the last button here is special. Uh, this area here allows me to turn on an auto linearization, an auto calibration feature that's based on a timer. If you have the optional Epson Spectra Photometer installed on this 9900, you can turn this feature on and have the RIP automatically, once a day, once per week, every two months or per month, automatically based on time and a day of the month, automatically verify if the hardware is still within spec. It's pretty right. awesome. Right. It's going to run the linearization, check the values on it, and make sure it's still within the, you know, the delta E that you specify. So. so I'm going to turn that feature off, actually, because yeah. one of the coolest parts of this uh, product is that, you know, I haven't seen a 9900 or 7900 printer ever sway in a long time. I don't think I've ever seen that. So I'm going to turn that off. But if you are worried or if the printer is old or aging or you want to make absolute sure that every printer is, stays within specification, you can just turn that feature yeah. on. But I'm going to go ahead and turn I, it off. I right think now. if you've got Spectra Proofer, there's no reason not to turn that on at least once a week. It's, All right, let's turn it on. It's just kind of a no-brainer quick let's check. Let's tell it to do it every Wednesday at... Uh, I don't know. No, that's, let's do it. You know, we come in at 8 o'clock, or I come in at 8 o'clock, so I'd set it up for like 7.30. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. It's all military time. Very good. All right, the cutter, automatic cutter. And the printer dryer, by the way, it's really not a printer dryer. This is the dryer that's built inside of Spectra Proofer. Um, the optional Epson Spectra Proofer can automatically dry down targets before we read them in. But if you're using Epson Genuine Proofing Media, one of the benefits of using Epson Media is you don't have to have the dryer on at all. Uh, so there's a lot of rips out there, a lot of medias out there that are used uh, in our printers. Some of those medias require, uh, they don't dry as fast as the Epson Genuine line of proofing media, so you may have to turn on a dryer and set the number of minutes before it reads all this data in. With Epson Genuine Media, you set this to zero, the dryer never comes on. The moment we make yeah. a print, we start reading in the color. All right, so now we're basically done setting up the printer. I'm going to go ahead and notice that, again, it's color. I'm going to hit Save. It asks me for a media set. This is because... Um, we have the ability later in the RIP to reference this setting uh, in the Job Explorer utility, which we'll talk about in another video. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, this is Grackle um, certified. Yep, I'd add 1440 to it because this is basically a resolu the, the resolution um, is important. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn these two on, uh, drag the line. And you may notice now that if I go to this workflow and go to color, or I'm sorry, verify, verify. as I go down to here, you can see now I can print the label. I want that turned on. Yep. Again, any setting I make, I have to remember to come over here and click on this. If I don't and click off of it, it'll ask me, do I want to make changes? Yep. Changes have been made. Do you want to save it and hit yes? Sure. So I always remember to always make sure that's yep. always gray. Now, um, at this point, we are done, and we can start printing, but notice these are red. I have found you really should just go ahead and just turn these on and make sure that linearization device and the actual uh, printer output device you've added match. Right. So under linearization device, if I come under device and go under media, I'm sorry, under setup, I want to make sure all this matches. So I'm going to select the 9900 again. Actually, can I give you a quick shortcut? Do it. Okay, so just go back to your Stylus Pro 9900. Okay, right click on it. Okay, select linear, linearized device. Um, that's going to copy the settings that you have. It's also going to launch Color Manager, but basically I can just exit out of Color Manager, and then all my settings are exactly the same. I'm done. Okay, so without having to manually enter anything, um, I've got all my settings. Very cool. All right. Just Learn something new every cut. day. Awesome. And then you're consistent. No issues. So at this point, we have completed uh, this video. We uh, added a workflow uh, that will allow you to create verified true certified proofs uh, on a Epson 9900 using our new proofing standard proofing paper 240 that comes in the box with the printer. Uh, this workflow will produce 
uh, very uh, color accurate proofs and we will show you in another video which is our video on how to optimize this workflow and optimize these two items so that it even gets even better but at this point you could start making prints and proofs that will be extremely tight in fact you'll be creating proofs with this workflow right now uh, that are probably better than anything that's ever come before. Yeah, I still think that, as, we, as we'll talk about in a future video, the creation of that 3CC or three-dimensional color correction file to really optimize color um, is critical and important in a verified yeah. workflow. So that's one thing that we will add later on. But as Mark said, right now you'll get insanely accurate color. Okay, so that's it for this video. We hope to see you in the next one.